and this T. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's episode is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative puppets, poseable sculptures, and animatronics. And you can find out more at trxdinosaurs.com. This week, we have an interview with Thomas Carr, who has a different take on T-Rex than David Hone or Pete Larson, who we've talked to before. And since this is our 200th episode, we're going to talk about T-Rex again as our dinosaur of the day. Yes, as a special revisit. Mm-hmm. Because a lot has changed in the last few years. And also how much we cover in our podcast. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be quite a bit longer than the first one. Yes. We don't do this often, but for a special occasion. Yes. I think this is the first one we've ever gone back to and revisited. It is, yeah. We also have a bunch of dinosaur news, including two more new dinosaurs. It's a new thing, I guess. And of course, we have a bunch of shout outs to give to some patrons who help us keep the podcast going. This week, we would like to thank Lucas and Eli, Wyatt, the Georges family, John Heck, Janice, Ranger Chris from Dino for Hire, Ray, Oliver E., Andrew and Helena Webb, Callum, Andrew Barling, and Ricky. And Ricky just increased up to the Stegosaurus level. Ooh. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you to everybody. And we're really excited that this is our 200th episode, and we're really happy to have you as patrons. And we have sent out the audiobook because you joined before our 200th episode. <laughs> so look for that in your emails as a, a special token of thanks. And uh, don't worry, though, if you're not a patron yet, we're coming out with some new things soon because SVP is coming up. It really comes up fast. Yeah. It's interesting that it coincided so closely with our 200th episode. It makes it kind of tricky to do both at the same time. It does. So we will be giving out some more details next week, but we'll be offering some extra special bonuses for our patrons who join before SVP. But in the meantime, enjoy the audiobook and thank you again. Yeah, and I think we're up to about 92 patrons, which yeah. is awesome. Yeah, it's exciting. So if you want to join this group of amazing people, then check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. Jumping into the news, this one I hinted at a little bit last week. There's a new dinosaur, and this one somehow slipped past all of our alerts and lists, probably because it's in a Chinese journal, and sometimes those don't get flagged in Google because they kind of have their whole own internet going on over there. But luckily, the dinosaur mailing list just spotted it and posted it, and that's how I found it. But it's a really amazing find. So so what Jun Chang Lu and others found was a new alvarosaurid. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked about two new alvarosauroids as well, which are closely related, but they're not technically true alvarosaurids. And alvarosaurids, again, are those tiny dinosaurs with even tinier arms, and then they have little claws at the ends of their tiny arms. So it's almost like claws just sticking out of their chest. It's really weird. No one really knows exactly why they have them. But this discovery might help explain it. They named the new alvarosaurid Chopanicus Jongai, and Chopanicus comes from the Chopa Formation in the Henan province of central China. And Jongai comes from... Swan Chung Zhang for his, quote, logistic support with fossil searching and excavations in the field. Cool. Yeah, I guess he must be very helpful to get a dinosaur named after him. Yeah. <laughs> so this specific individual of Cheopanicus is incredibly important because it was found with a broken dinosaur eggshell that appears to be from an oviraptorosaur. And they're basically proposing that this alvarosaurid may have used its little tiny alvarosaurid claws to break open this oviraptorosaur egg. Egg then, thief. Yeah. Egg thief. <laughs> exactly. And the crazy thing about that is that that would make Chopanicus the real oviraptorosaur because oviraptor, of course, was named because it was believed to be eating eggs in a nest when it was found with a bunch of eggs. And then later on, we figured out that those were its own eggs and it was just sort of in its nest. Maybe and, even protecting them. <laughs> yeah. And Oviraptor's species name is even Philoceratops because they think that it was eating 
or they thought at the time, that it was eating ceratopsian eggs. So it was like a lover of ceratopsians in that it was eating them. But yeah, so that's all kind of wrong now. But now this one that's known as eating eggs might come full circle and have been found with its eggs being eaten, which I, I don't know. It's like a crazy twist <laughs> on the old oviraptor thing. Unless we find out years from now it was actually its own egg. Well, yeah, so there's an interesting thing about that. So they found its femur, and because of that, they can estimate its body mass. That's usually how they do it. So they think Chopanicus weighed about half a kilogram or just over a pound. And the nearby egg, they estimate at weighing about a kilogram or just over two pounds. So the egg was twice as heavy as the adults, and they can tell that it was an adult. I'll get into that a little bit more later. So... If the egg is twice as big as the adult, it can't lay it. So they figure there's a good, solid piece of evidence that it was in the nest or otherwise ended up with this eggshell in some way other than laying it. Obviously, you can end up next to an egg that you didn't lay without eating it. But yeah, it helps to explain those little claws a little bit. And then I was thinking it would be nice if we could see a little more detail about the nest and see if it had egg on its face. Nah. Eh? Yeah. I'm excited about that joke. I had to write that one down. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously you can't because that doesn't fossilize, unfortunately. So other stuff that they found, they found 35 vertebrae, including the sacrum, but there were none from the back. So it's just the tail and the neck. The vertebrae are fully fused. That's how they know it's an adult, which is useful when we're trying to do the size estimate, figuring out if it's its own egg. Because the other possibility is obviously it could have hatched out of that egg, but... If it's an adult, adults don't hatch out of eggs. And then there are also other parts from the hips that they found, and they found the whole right leg. It's only missing parts of the foot. So like I said, they could use that femur to sort of estimate its body mass. And then they also said that the femur is slightly sigma-shaped, which is similar to another alvarosaurid parvicursor. And sigma-shaped, we may have talked about it with femurs before, I'm not sure. They often describe how sigma-shaped they are to sort of relate species. And if you're familiar with like an S-shaped curve on a graph where it's sort of like is near the x-axis, slowly increasing, and then it increases real rapidly and then kind of feathers off like the letter S, that's sort of the same curve. A little bit of that going on with a femur. So the top points a little bit more one way than the, the bottom points the other way. The researchers also mentioned that the arms could have been used for burrowing or breaking termite nests, but they really favor the egg-breaking hypothesis, and I think that's just an amazing solution to this crazy arm thing that everybody's been wondering about. And they also included an amazing piece of paleo art by Zhao Chong, which will definitely be the cover art for our news post on Friday, or you can just use the link in the show notes if you want to see it before then. You have to download the PDF because it's in this kind of strange journal format, but it is an open access journal apparently, so that's cool. They say that it's now housed in the Henan Geological Museum in Zhengzhou, China, but I'm not sure if it's on display. It's just in there somewhere. They didn't specifically say. The museum is on our museum map, though, so if you're ever in Henan, China, you can check it out. Along with a whole bunch of other museums. Yeah, there's a ton of museums. The, this area doesn't have as many dinosaurs as other areas of China. But it's still a lot. Yes, there's still quite a few. <laughs> so yeah, we may have cracked the mystery on what they use those claws for. Get it? Cracked? Oh, goodness. <laughs> You're on a roll. <laughs> Happy 200th episode. <laughs> now with more puns. <laughs> <laughs> the next article I'm going to talk about was by Nan Zhang and others, also from China. And this one, this discovery, came about 900 miles to the southwest of the previous discovery, but it's still in China, kind of in between the countries of Myanmar and Vietnam, so pretty far south in China in this case. This new dinosaur is named Ejosaurus sunae, and the authors note that it was reported back in 2010, but it wasn't formally described until now, so it's, I'm still counting it as new. We usually don't really talk much about them until they're actually described. Mm -hmm. And Ejosaurus refers to Chushong Yi, which is an autonomous prefecture of the Yunnan province. So I guess it's mostly the Yi part that made the translation. 
And then Sunne is in honor of Professor Ai Ling Sun for her great contribution to Chinese vertebrate fossils, including those from Lufeng. That's two dinosaurs named in honor of somebody. That's true, and a little bit unusual for Chinese dinosaurs. This one they found almost as much as a little tiny dinosaur. They have an quote-unquote undistorted skeleton about 7 meters or 23 feet long, including a well-preserved skull and mandible and a mostly complete vertebral series. The skull is interesting because they describe it as high and dome-shaped, and most of the teeth are preserved in its unusually slender jaw, but the teeth are unfortunately mostly broken near the ends, so that it doesn't look great. It looks kind of like one of those cartoons of somebody getting hit in the face <laughs> while the teeth are kind of broken off, but I think you can still get most of the information about the teeth even if they are largely broken. Within the well-preserved skull, they also found the brain case, which is pretty cool. They didn't talk too much about what they could tell, what it could potentially sense or think, because sometimes they're like, ooh, look at this big bulb in the front that would help it with eyesight, but they didn't go into any of that in this paper. What kind of dinosaur is it? It's a sauropodomorph. Mm. Yeah. Nice. One of your faves. As well as the skull through the 31st vertebra at the base of the tail, they also found the hips both femora, or, you know, plural for femurs, the shoulder blades, and all of the forelimbs, including the fingers, but missing both of the wrists super weirdly. Yeah. It's like the, in the drawing of it, it's like you have the end of the hand and then the whole arm, and there's just this little gap where the wrist should be that they didn't find on either of the hands. Wonder what happened to it. Yeah, I don't know. It's so strange. Maybe the bones are just really small so they could get washed away easier or something. I don't know. Hmm. And its hands are still very hand-like, meaning they're not really turning into feet yet, even though it's a sauropodomorph. And its feet also aren't really that sauropod-like. They're still relatively normal feet, not like elephant feet or later sauropods where they're kind of the ends of pillars. They describe its femur as weakly sigmoidal. What does that mean? <laughs> it just means that it curves a little tiny bit at the ends in opposite directions. I was trying to figure out exactly what that means for sort of how fast they can move or anything like that, but I couldn't find any papers referencing it. I have to ask a paleontologist one of these days. <laughs> the 7 meter or 23 foot length is actually their estimate for the full length of Egosaurus, not just the length of what they found, and that includes all these missing bones of the tail, which is probably like a third of the animal. So at 23 feet, it is very small for a sauropod, but it is about average for an early sauropodomorph. They list some other ones, and they're like, yeah, it's about normal. It's mid-sized, if you will. They also found that two of its tail vertebrae are fused together, and they assume that to be pathological, like some kind of tail injury, and then as it healed, they kind of got stuck together. And there definitely needs to be more study of the age of the rocks in the area, because they only say that it's quote-unquote early Jurassic, which is a pretty vague timeline that gives you about a 25 million year time period. It's almost like half of the time between now and T-Rex. So it's somewhere in the 200 to 175 million year ago ballpark. But yeah, no matter what, early Jurassic is kind of where you expect to see these types of sauropodomorphs. So it's not too surprising that way. They say that it is more closely related to true sauropods, things like Apatosaurus or some of these, you know, longer necked <laughs> and heavier sauropods than other early sauropodomorphs from the Lufeng formation. And as a result, its closest relative is Musaurus or Ankysaurus, depending on which tree you look at, and not Lufungosaurus or any of the other sauropodomorphs that are actually from the same formation. So that's kind of interesting. Diversity. Yeah, it does look like the Lufeng formation has quite a few different layers in it, though, that range quite a few millions of years, which might be why they don't know specifically for this one, because it's kind of all over the place. So I guess we need to get in there and do some more study on the sediment, figure out how old these guys are, get a better idea about how these early sort of potomorphs turned into Sabrina's favorites. <laughs> yeah, we want all the answers. <laughs> Also happening in Zhengzhou, in Henan province in China, there are nine displays at the Yellow River Yingbing Grand Hotel of fossils that were originally from China and then went overseas and they've since been returned to China. And they include a Smilodon skull and Gansu tortoise. There's also 
a baby long sinensis fossil. Ooh, the that's egg. a cool one. Yeah, it's the egg with the embryo. It's nicknamed Baby Louie. It was found in 1993. It's an oviraptorosaur that lived about 86 million years ago. And it was out of the country, out of China for about 20 years and returned in 2013 and put on display in the Henan Geological Museum. And now it's on display at this hotel. And after it's run at the hotel, the fossils are going to be put on exhibit at the Henan Geological Museum until the end of November. And the reason for this is China has a fossil protection regulation that went into effect in 2011. And since then, more than 5,000 fossils have been returned. Cool. They got plenty of museums to start filling up. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. <laughs> kind of tying into what Garrett was talking about with elephants and dinosaurs, sort of. It's very loosely related, but <laughs> I thought I'd try. There's these two elephants at the Perth Zoo in Australia. They went on a Kind of a tour to meet and greet animatronic dinosaurs that are part of the new exhibit Jurassic Park. So these are real elephants, not just animatronic elephants. Yeah, elephants from the zoo. The two of them named Permai and Trisha. And they walked around, meet and greet, as you do, I guess. <laughs> and they were tapping on some of the dinosaur heads with their trunks. And they also checked out some of the teeth with their trunks. <laughs> The exhibit, the Jurassic Park, is part of the zoo's 120th anniversary, and the idea is to remind visitors to protect the animals we have today. And I do wonder what was going on in the elephants' heads as they're tapping on the teeth. They must have realized that these dinosaurs can't hurt them. Or at least assumed it. Yeah. They're lucky that they couldn't, because <laughs> yeah. you're sticking your trunk into a dinosaur's mouth is not a great idea, generally. Yep. They're curious. <laughs> Worked out this time. It would probably work out every time. An elephant and a non-avian dinosaur? Probably. <laughs> we got a really nice email from our listener, Julian, and he published a new sort of teaching material slash lesson plan about dinosaurs for kids and sent it to us. And he said that it was sponsored by the Costa Rican Distance University and paid for by the Costa Rican government. Cool. So it's really cool because it's in both English and Spanish. And I read through it, and it has a lot of really great stuff in it. I really enjoyed the lesson plan. It clearly ties together a lot of different sort of skills that people are often trying to teach kids. It's got three main activities in it. The first one is reconstructing a dinosaur. And the way that he proposes doing it is sort of by combining a theropod skeleton with a bird. So he kind of has a picture of something like a velociraptor. And then you put, say, like an ostrich. You do this in Photoshop. So you have like another layer with an ostrich picture. And then you try to like replicate the tail to stretch it out over the bones of the skeleton of the velociraptor. So you end up with a bird that's been shaped into the shape of a dinosaur. Almost like a chickenosaurus. Yeah, kind of. But it's really cool. And they say that the point of it is basically that the students will learn how difficult it is to recreate a dinosaur, even if we do have a full skeleton. And a lot of times you don't have a full skeleton, you just have part of a jaw or something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so how would you ever know exactly what it looked like? You can never really be totally sure. The next activity is for attempting to copy a piece of paleo art. And it's an analogy to reverse engineering a dinosaur from a bird and that it's impossible to do perfectly, although we may be able to get close. It's hard to say. And then the third one may be my favorite. I don't know. I really like the first one too, which is about the ethics of collecting dinosaurs. And I think the way this activity is structured is really clever. So basically you have students take on the role of either an amateur collector, a fossil dealer, or a museum paleontologist. And then they debate what to do with these specific dinosaur fossils that they have cards for in the lesson plan. And they're really complicated ones because it'll be like, oh, this dinosaur was discovered in a country, but they don't have a museum right now, or the museum recently burned down. And then, so then the question is like, well, what do you do with that dinosaur? Some of them are supposed to be really scientifically valuable. Others are less valuable. And it would be really interesting to see how kids would debate this. And it would definitely lead to a really good discussion about how you handle fossils. One thing I liked about it too is it referenced this article from 2013 written by Andrew Farkey. And it's a really excellent article. So I want to talk a little bit about that too, because I think it's really relevant right now. Basically, the title of the article from 2013, still very relevant today, is Developing an Ethic for Digital Fossils. And in it, Farkey basically argues that 
the current state of ethics with regards to fossils as exhibited by museums is that all these fossils in the world belong to everybody. So everyone should have access to them. They shouldn't be in private collections. They should be carefully studied and excavated because you only get one chance at it and all that sort of anti-commercial trading of fossil sentiment. But what he points out is that even though museums say that they have this ethical responsibility to curate these dinosaur fossils and other fossils for everyone in the world to see and you know to keep them indefinitely in good condition they don't really allow people to take pictures of them or scan them or otherwise have access to the fossils so he points out that it's actually pretty inconsistent and it's almost like saying well it belongs to the world so it should be in my museum but once it's in my museum then i'll control who gets access to it and he doesn't see that as really a fair <laughs> position to take. And I completely agree 100% with this. It, one of the interesting things he points out is like a, a typical argument against this is, well, if there are digital copies around, no one's going to want to come to my museum to see the original. But that definitely isn't true. I mean, you can look at any sort of analogy with pieces of art. If I put a print of a Mona Lisa on my wall People aren't going to be like, oh, I'm not going to go to the Louvre to see the real Mona Lisa. Everyone always wants to see the original thing. It's like there's such a difference in people's minds that I don't think that's a real issue. And then another piece of, of the argument, which I think is just hilarious, is that 99.9% .9 of fossils don't really have any value outside of scientific research. So when we put all these practices in place to sort of restrict access to them, the only people it hurts is people trying to do research because nobody's looking up some obscure ammonite from 80 million years ago because they want to print it out in some commercial way. It's only the researchers that want access to it. So there isn't really even any risk for most of these fossils as being used commercially. And then the other kind of side of it is, even if it is being used commercially, why does that matter? Because if things are being used commercially, that means people are really interested in it. And the more people are interested in dinosaurs, the more likely we are to get funding for museums, the more likely people are to go to museums to see these kinds of things in real life. And it's just, I don't know. It seems like the argument doesn't hold any water. One of the arguments in the comments was, well, it can be really expensive to scan fossils. So if you put forth the expense to scan a fossil, you shouldn't be expected to give it away for free, which I, I think is a really good point. And the sort of hashing out of this argument all those like five years ago <laughs> is basically like yeah if a museum scans something you can own the scan that you made but you shouldn't be restricting other people from scanning it and if someone else wants to scan it and give it away for free it doesn't cost you anything so just let them do that and let people take pictures in your museums because that can be really helpful especially the reason this really came to my mind was with brazil's national museum in rio and they would have definitely benefited from lots of third-party documentation. Now there are all these fossils that they fully intended to keep in great condition forever. But when the museum burned down, they're left without any of this information. And now they're basically begging people that have taken photographs, which may have not even been allowed by the policy of the museum. I couldn't find the exact policy, so I'm not sure. And trying to piece together what these fossils looked like because they didn't have good enough records of all of them. So... Yeah, I think we really need to loosen these laws a little bit, make it a little more consistent that if the museum is there and it's intended for public display and public consumption, you need to allow people to take pictures of the things and use them however they want. We've run into a lot of interesting photography policies too, because we go into a lot of museums and take pictures. And generally what the rule is, is that it's for non-commercial use, but non-commercial doesn't really have much of a legally binding limitation it's very vague so non-commercial could mean that i'm not going to print it on a t-shirt and sell that it could mean that i'm not going to put it on a book cover it could even mean that i'm not going to put it on a blog post but whenever we've asked them they always say that it's okay to post it on social media or on a blog but it's not really clearly defined so generally i think it should just be defined as a ccby licensing which basically means that you say where the original is held but you don't have any other restrictions, so you can use it commercially because I don't really so see any harm. Do anything you want as long as you attribute it properly. Exactly. I think that's 
the most consistent position, at least, that a museum could take if it's being held for the public and the public to use. However, to say that they're the only ones that can make money off it is crazy mm -hmm. because then you're starting to get into an argument about who gets to make money off fossils. And that doesn't seem like an argument they want to start making when they're talking about how fossils should be held for the public good and not held in private collections because then they're basically a private collection in a way. Right. And we've even come across some museums where we have to pay to be able to take photographs, and it's still restricted how we can use those photographs. Yeah, and then we've had other museums where you pay to take pictures and it's no longer restricted. You can do whatever you want with it. Mm -hmm. And then there's another type where we've had to sign things where we basically just say that we're not going to use the photographs to slander the museum or use it in like anti-scientific rhetoric. So there's a whole myriad of different ways that museums try to restrict the use of, quote unquote, their fossils. But yeah, I don't think they're really their fossils. They're everyone's fossils. So anyway, <laughs> I think that's where I would end up if I was in this children's exercise. But yeah, Andrew Farkey ended up there through his career and I'm totally on his side. So I just wanted to bring that up, especially with the National Museum in Brazil burning down and us losing all this information, which could have obviously been avoided if collections were more open and available for people to take pictures and scan. I think. I'm not positive in that case. So really, we just all need to document it. We need to have as many copies as possible. And then there's the least chance of losing these wonderful things and the best chance that people have them available when they need them. Yeah. It's very easy right now for everything to be digitized. Mm -hmm. So Seems like, why not? There's really no reason not to, other than like fear of losing out on monetary gain, which probably is minimal because <laughs> not very many people are going to pay for these 3D prints or whatever anyway. Before we move on to our t rex Opolis of an episode. <laughs> the interview followed by the dinosaur of the day. Yes. We have a word from our sponsor, TRX Dinosaurs, which... As Garrett mentioned at the top of the show, they make innovative puppets and posable sculptures and animatronics. They post a lot of really cool works in progress on their Instagram at TRX Dinosaurs. One of my favorites is this one of a proof of concept kind of prototype of a new puppet. And it shows <laughs> the head moving around, looking around, up and down. It actually, it reminds me a little bit of Jim Henson's Dark Crystal. Oh, like the Skeksis and things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's really true. Or you can order a Chilpanicus with an egg, <laughs> yeah. cracking open the egg. Oh, that'd be great. I'm imagining them now kind of body slamming the egg, mm -hmm. like claws first, and like using their weight behind it. And then mm. it's like, you don't need arms because you really just want like a pointy chest because you're chest bumping oh, it. Oh, you could do an animatronic of that? Yeah. The that'd movement, be really yeah. cool. So lots of possibilities. And if you want to learn more or order your own, then go to their website at trxdinosaurs.com. And now on to our interview with Thomas Carr, where we dive into his research into what T-Rex was likely all about. Today, we're joined by Dr. Thomas Carr. He's the Associate Professor of Biology at Carthage College. He's also a director at the Carthage Institute of Paleontology and the Senior Scientific Advisor to the Dinosaur Discovery Museum. Jumping right into it, you were the lead author on the Displetosaurus Horneri paper, which led to a lot of clickbaity titles about T. rex being a sensitive lover. What do you yes. think of that kind of interpretation of your paper? <laughs> oh, I don't mind at all. It was actually part of the contents mm -hmm. of the research. And to, to make a long story short, uh, the evidence suggests that Tyrannosaurids had hypersensitive snouts, uh, very similar to the fashion of modern crocodilians, which also have hypersensitive snouts. And that, in crocs, that was driven in part by, almost certainly by being sort of amphibious predators. Uh, crocs have sensitive snouts for detecting very small ripples in water. Uh, so we have an instance of convergent evolution, like certainly trinosaurs weren't hunting <laughs> in water, but we have predatory archosaurs that are converging on having very sensitive snouts. And the sensitive snout uh, can be very useful in many different ways. So crocodilians obviously sensing you know, water ripples, but it goes way above and beyond that. Uh, crocs are very tactile creatures. Um, so when they you know, when they engage in courtship, uh, they will rub snouts, they'll rub mm -hmm. their snouts on each other's bodies. And also they check um, sites for nests, at least some other crocs do. 
This is in crocs, including alligators. Um, they check the temperature of the nest as the eggs are incubating, so on and so forth. So given that Tyrannosaurs had the same integument on their faces, and we know this from the texture of the skin on their face, which correlates to a specific type of scale and innervation. And also, uh, tyrannosaur snouts are just shot through with holes through which uh, nerves extend to innervate the skin. Crocodiles become a very useful model for understanding what must have been happening with tyrannosaurs. So we have sensitive snouts or say probing carcasses, um, also for interacting with each other during courtship. So, you know, re reproduction is basically the, the central theme of evolutionary biology and mm -hmm. the success of any species, really. So given that tyrannosaurs had the same sensory equipment on their faces as crocodilians, it's reasonable to assume that the function and behaviors would have been the same. Uh, Tyrannosaurs are fairly smart for theropods. They have fairly large uh, endocranial spaces and ergo relatively large brains. Mm -hmm. Crocodilians are very comparable to tyrannosaurs in terms of brain to body size. Oh, really? So we know that these behaviors would have been well within the reach of tyrannosaurs, like intellectually, you know, they're basically on par. <laughs> so it really isn't a stretch to view crocodilians as the model for tyrannosaur behavior. You know, in a more personal sense, crocodilians have become much more interesting and exciting to me. I really pay attention uh, to crocodilians more than I ever have, and that's uh, through the literature mm -hmm. and also observing them when, when I can. So that's it in a, in a nutshell. Uh, transfers had hypersensitive snouts. The, that hypersensitivity was important basically across the board in terms of these animals' day-to-day -day lives. And uh, crocs become a very important model for what we should expect transfers to have been really like. That's really interesting. So speaking of T-Rex sort of faces, another thing at last SVP, you presented on how T-Rex didn't need lips. Could you tell yes. us a little bit about that? Well, part and parcel of the hypersensitivity hypothesis is the entire integumentary system of the head. And uh, basically the entire face of Transaurids has a wrinkly texture which matches one to one with what we see in crocodilians. So, if you examine, put a T Rex skull next to an alligator skull or a big saltwater crocodile, you'll see a very similar texture. And we think that that is causal. Um, the wrinkliness comes from the flat scales. Mm -hmm. And those flat scales uh, have little sensory structures called integumentary sensory organs or ISOs. Um, this texture on crocodilians goes all the way down to the margins of the jaws, both on the you know, upper and lower jaws. This, and crocodilians obviously do not have lips. <laughs> the same morphology is seen in tyrannosaurs. Ergo, there's no difference. We can't falsify the crocodilian null because there is no difference. And ergo, in tyrannosaurs, those flat scales would have extended right down to the tooth margins, just like crocodilians. Uh, we see absolutely no evidence for anything else. And so I think that angle also did get a bit of play in the media as well. Yeah, I thought one of the things I liked about your presentation at SVP is you mentioned that T-Rex replace their teeth really often too. So yes. even if the teeth weren't in the best shape because they weren't getting, you know, sort of maintained by saliva if you're losing a tooth every couple of years doesn't matter yeah <laughs> yeah it's negligible and and that's what we see in living crocodilians you know their teeth are bared all the time and crocs aren't in the water all the time sometimes they're in very dry conditions for extended periods and you know their teeth all didn't fall out and they didn't go extinct. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no reason to think transfers were any different. So, yeah, and the replacement rates, you know, would keep pace with any uh, damage that the teeth would suffer. You know, natural selection would take care of that very early in the lineage of probably dinosaurs, if not earlier. Uh, natural selection is extraordinarily unforgiving. <laughs> and there's every reason to expect that um, that the anatomy of the teeth would have been secured against, you know, extinction. 
it's interesting too with the the talk of the null hypothesis because that seems to come up in a lot of sort of debates about T-Rex. People are arguing which piece of related evidence should be the standard. So I see it all the time with the feathers because people say, well, you Tyrannus had feathers and that's mm -hmm. sort of a Tyrannosaurus, not really ancestor, but in the same sort of lineage. And therefore yeah. the simplest answer, if we don't have evidence or proof the T-Rex has all these scale impressions from all over its body, then we assume there were feathers there. But other people say, well, you know, we have a couple skin impressions from close relatives to T-Rex and they don't show feathers and therefore the null should be that T-Rex doesn't have feathers. So what do you think about the feather side of things? Yeah, the bottom line is that the phylogeny or the family tree is everything. That, that sets up the framework for setting up the question and finding a way to answer it. So you're right. Animals like D. long and Utranus uh, un unambiguously have feathers. The association is clear. We have the fossils. Mm -hmm. And we do have samples of integument from Tranosaurids. So there's skin impression from T. rex, Tranosaurus batar, Displitosaurus trosus, and both species of Albertosaurus. And in every case, what we see are scales. Mm -hmm. uh, so the picture looks like this, that just like every standard um, ornithodiron, basal tyrannosaurus had feathers. Then somewhere along the line between D. long and the tyrannosaurids, there was a switchover from feathers to scales. And we can st state that objectively because we have the fossils and also those fossils are sampled from throughout the body. So we know that there's scales on the neck, on the torso, from the hips, tail and legs. We have a good distribution for those scale impressions. And so we see this pattern of the switch from feathers to scales across multiple ornithodiron lineages, specifically dinosaurs. So we see that feathers are lost along the line of sauropods. We have skin impression for those which are scaly. We have a lot of skin impression for ceratopsians, uh, which show scales and not feathers. So feathers were lost along that line. In the Thyreophorans, things like Stegosaurus, Scutellosaurus, thing, and the Ankylosaurians, they were scaly creatures. And so feathers had to be lost somewhere along the line toward them. So Tyrannosaurs are no uh, exception to this general pattern. There's two questions. And that the first is, is how easy is it to lose feathers and gain scales? It seems pretty easy. <laughs> The second question is, how is that pulled off developmentally? Because we don't see it among living birds. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess the third part of it is, you know, what's the frequency of this pattern across ornithodirons? You know, it's in and of itself, this is a fairly rich question. And transors are just transorids, at, rather, are yet another example of this loss. What we do not see is the switchover from scales to feathers. That only happened once at the, in the common ancestor of Ornithodira, but we don't go from feathers to scales and back to feathers. And that's kind of interesting, at least from what we see in the fossil record. Hmm. It hasn't happened and among living birds. We don't really see it either. Interesting. I assume you're subscribing to the, the theory that basically there's a common archosaur ancestor that has feathers. Is that right? Ornithodiron. So I think we can take feathers back down to the common ancestor of pterosaurs and dinosaurs. Okay. Mm. So my naive read of the data is that's where feathers first evolved and they were hollow filaments. That's what we see in pterosaurs and also in relatively basal slurosaurs. Ornithischians like Tianyu Long show that feathers can, feather evolution can sort of take off and produce relatively elaborate features relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is, I think feathers at Ornithodira, and as more fossils are found, you know, from northeastern China and other places, we'll, we'll continue to fill in these taxonomic gaps in terms of where, you know, which dinosaurs had feathers and so on. But that's my naive read of the fossil <laughs> record. I know that uh, there's been a couple of researchers who have looked at this question in terms of how many times feathers or integumentary structures like this might have evolved among the group and come up with a different version, you know, that what pterosaurs have are different from dinosaurs. I don't think that's a parsimonious hypothesis. What I'm saying right now is my own, my own <laughs> work hypothesis and others may disagree. Yeah. 
Well, most of the stuff we've talked about so far, there's lots of publications on both sides of, you know, feathers, lips, all that kind of stuff. People have different opinions. Although I'm not sure if there's really been much of a publication about lips that I can think not of. Yeah. <laughs> there have been blog posts for sure. Yeah. <laughs> People really want their lips. It's 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 a interesting phenomenon. I mean, it makes sense to me as a lay person because I have lips and it, <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, you need lips for your teeth. But then when you start to analyze some of it, maybe not. With us mammals, uh, lips and cheeks are adaptations for suckling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're securing our mouth on a teat so that we don't die um, <laughs> after we're born. And it's very, you know, our anatomy is very is specific to mammals. Yeah, very true. Mm -hmm. um, so you would never have that evolve among <laughs> egg-laying uh, animals that don't suckle their young. It's just not, the, it's just not on the table. And the anatomy, uh, the facial anatomy bears that out as well. I think there's a lot of lay people who would be happy to think that because they grew up looking at illustrations of tyrannosaurs without <laughs> oh, yeah. lips. Yeah. Yeah. People are always really excited whenever a depiction airs back towards the, the sort of Jurassic Park T-Rex, everyone gets very excited. <laughs> Yeah, it's really unfortunate. Um, that image of T-Rex is extraordinarily inaccurate. I think, to my eye, that, and from what I know of Rex, that is not what T-Rex looked like. And it's quite remarkable to see how that basic template, the Jurassic Park template, has completely taken over. So mm -hmm. you, you can have dinosaur toys and other products, books, so on, so on and so forth, that are all based on the Jurassic Park Rex. Mm-hmm. It's just an incredible and, and dismaying for me to see how ubiquitous it is. So what, just taking over. what are some of the differences? Um, well, I think it's sort of like um, there's a lot of detail that sum up to a very precise face. It's mm -hmm. just like any individual's face. So, it, you know, we'd just be going into mind numbing detail on, you know, <laughs> everything that's wrong with it. But at the end of the day, to my eye, they did not base the model of the head on an actual skull. Mm. And when paleo artists ask advice uh, from me or want me to critique their work, I always tell them, go to your local museum if there is a T-Rex cast or whatever on display and spend time with it. Draw it, sketch it, sculpt the maquette, get to know the form of the head and the face as well as you possibly can. And if you really do put in the time and give the the dinosaur the attention, you will get it right. Hmm. And then presumably an artist would be able to start recognizing where people are going wrong. Mm -hmm. And that sort of investment just simply isn't done. And in my view, it certainly wasn't done in the case of the Jurassic Park Rex. I mean, they're just fundamental errors in the skull. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mostly like the facial features, less so the sort of bo general body plan of it. Yeah, okay, I'll put it this way. The Jurassic Park T-Rex is to actual T-Rex as Mickey Mouse is to an actual mouse. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> That's how far off it is. <laughs> that is harsh. <laughs> it's honest. Yeah. I mean, you know, th th there's nothing to gain in pulling any punches. Mm -hmm. And what I would hope to see is that some effort would be made uh, maybe not with the Jurassic Park franchise because they seem to be too attached to these really awful dinosaurs uh, that they came up with in 93, that at least future films would uh, just bother to get it right. Yeah. I mean, th think of how much effort people went into making sure that Daniel Day-Lewis looked something like, you know, Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't want to screw that one up. And it really isn't hard to get dinosaurs right. I mean, all it takes is a bit of time uh, with a skull, a bit of time with a paleontologist who is anatomically based. And that really reduces the opportunity for error and really increases the probability of an accurate dinosaur. I mean, what's there to lose? <laughs> <Yeah>. That's true. <laughs> I do often say that I wish they would update at least, at the very least, the new dinosaurs that they introduced in Jurassic Park to be, you know, not just of that sort of 1993 style, but, yeah. 
it, yeah, like you say, at least other movies, at the very, very least, could do something more than just straight up carbon copy the the Jurassic Park style T Rex. That would be nice. It would. <laughs> I fail to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> So speaking of, I guess, T-Rex and T-Rex lookalikes, what do you think about Nano Tyrannosaurus? And I heard you say Tyrannosaurus, Tyrannosaurus Batar mm -hmm. earlier. So I'm assuming Tarbosaurus is not the genus you would give it. That, that's right. We'll just take those one at a time. So in evolutionary biology, in science, names have a meaning. And the meaning of names is that they are lineages. Mm -hmm. They're a common ancestor and all of their descendants. And we, as paleontologists, as evolutionary biologists, part of what we do is we, is we recover the evolutionary relationships between the species that we study. That's something that I'm very steeped in. And so, for example, we published a family tree of Tyrannosaurus in a, in a Horneri paper, an updated one that Steve Rosati and I did uh, back in 2016. Mm -hmm. And so that family tree structure then becomes the template for the names that you use. Now, the species that we see, the fossils that we can actually hold in our hands, have names. So generally a genus, which is sort of like a street, and then a species name, which, are, which is the exact house on the street, say the house number. So Rex is the species of a lineage called Tyrannosaurus, which is the bigger street. And its closest relative lives in Asia. And its name is Batar. And so the genus Tyrannosaurus it contains two species, Rex and Batar. So when you say the name Tyrannosaurus, you're referring to that lineage that has two species. And when you say Tyrannosaurus Rex or Tyrannosaurus Batar, you are indicating that relationship. So the name has maximum information value. For example, I take the same approach to Displetosaurus. So we have Displetosaurus horneri and Displetosaurus terosus, which are each other's closest relative. Mm. They have the same genus name because I'm trying to maximize information content to indicate what the relationships are. And finally, I use the names Albertosaurus libratus and Albertosaurus sarcophagus to indicate their relationship to each other. No one else does this. <laughs> every, every, I'm alone. Uh, I'm completely alone on this. Um, everyone else uses genus names for every species. So Tarbosaurus instead of Tyrannosaurus batar and Gorgosaurus instead of Albertosaurus libratus. The only ones that everyone leaves alone is Displetosaurus, an interesting exception that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> uh, people ought to just make up a new name for Horneri, I guess. So in terms of naming, I think that we have to include as much informative information within reason as we can. And so I say Tyrannosaurus batar deliberately to indicate to you and whoever I'm talking to uh, that I'm talking about the closest relative, the sister species that are called technically of T-Rex. Interesting. I mean, that's a it's a good tool for science communication, I think. In your papers, do you... I'm looking at the one from 2016 because I was reviewing your phylogeny before we talked. And mm -hmm. in there you have Tarbosaurus, but did you update that in the new one or did your co-authors force your hand to <laughs> Tarbosaurus versus Tyrannosaurus? Option two. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't lead, so um, I didn't fight. <laughs> I didn't fight for it. But if you take a look at uh, the Horneri paper, you'll see all, all the names have been fixed in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, I'm alone. I mean, no one else has followed me down this path. Um, I have a blog called Transrodia Central, mm -hmm. and I actually set out the case there. So it's not a, obviously, it's not a technical source, but if people want to follow up on this, um, I have the whole argument there with diagrams showing the usefulness of this approach. Oh, cool. cool. And then a lot of people, I think, do agree with you on nano tyrannus, though, right? I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, at the end of the day, what matters is which hypothesis has support. Mm -hmm. And so now Tyrannus, no matter how you look at it, has no empirical support. Um, even in the, in the inaugural paper, the way a new species is established is through something called a diagnosis, which is a list of features that sets your new species apart from everything else. Mm -hmm. And in every case... For the diagnosis of nano, it's they're describing either damage 
to the skull, if you can believe that. Uh, strange, true. They're describing damage. They're also describing features shared with T-Rex. And they've also tossed in juvenile features as well. So the species or the taxon now trans doesn't even get on the runway, let alone into the air. You know, so if anyone is going to try to rescue nanotrans, they have to deal with that intractable problem. Gotcha. Uh, the problem with tyrannosaurs, and this is something that, um, that I deal with in every project I work on, especially the one I'm working on now, which is on growth in T-Rex, and that is that there's a dismaying number of tyrannosaur specimens that are privately owned. Yeah. And what that means is that uh, science cannot touch privately owned specimens. Uh, Fossils have to be in a real museum, uh, either accredited by the American Alliance of Museums or uh, maybe validated as a federal repository by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, real museums, real repositories uh, guarantee the storage and curation and safety of fossils for as long as civilization lasts. <laughs> and without that guarantee, science just cannot touch privately owned specimens. And this is a very a pressing issue in my own sample size uh, for T-Rex. I'm just, I actually have my, this project open right now. I have 44 specimens of T-Rex in this growth study. And I know that there is probably at least 20 that are privately owned that I will never see and will never be included in this project. And the worst part of it is that most of the fossils that we have of T-Rex are adults. We have very few small juveniles and subadults. You know, of course, there's notable ones like Jane and uh, the Cleveland skull, but they're just a handful. And I know for a fact that among these privately owned specimens are juveniles and subadults that fill in critical gaps in the growth series. Uh, hmm. Yet science will never touch those because they're privately owned, either owned outright by, by somebody or in someone's stock room waiting to be sold or to go to auction. That's a huge bummer. Yeah. Yep. I agree. I feel like we should end on a, on a lighter note. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm currently working on a project uh, that is an update of a publication that Thomas Williamson and I did back in 2004. Uh, we published the first cladistically derived growth series for a dinosaur. And cladistics is basically just a technique that's used to recover uh, evolutionary trees, evolutionary relationships between different species. It's the foundation of cladograms that you see in all those technical papers. And since growth is the same sort of phenomenon as evolution, a nested set of changes that go in one direction, the same algorithms can be applied to growth data as they are to evolutionary data. And so we uh, recovered a growth series for T-Rex based on about 84 characters and five T-Rex specimens. And over the past several years since that time, I've slowly built up that data set to 44 T-Rexes <laughs> and 1,750 features. Oh, wow. wow. So, which covers the entire skeleton. Our original growth series just included skull data, uh, but I've since expanded it uh, to include the, the whole thing. <laughs> and so we'll get... Hopefully soon, I'm just coding in all the features right now. That will take some some weeks because I do have a full time job. Uh, but I'm hoping very shortly to have to have that one submitted for publication. Nice, and we'll see if that's another nail in the nano tyrannus coffin at that point. Well, uh, my expectation is the null, so the basic result will not differ from the O4 article, mm -hmm. um, and meaning that. The Cleveland skull will fall out in the same place on the tree, and it will be shown to be just part of this continuous transition from the smallest juveniles to the big adults. And so all the features that, that look unique really aren't. They're really all transitional. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that'll be really cool, because that's exactly the kind of study you need to kind of settle a debate. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the Dinosaur Discovery Museum? Yes. The Dinosaur Discovery Museum is in downtown Kenosha. It is under the umbrella of the Kenosha Museum Complex, which is 
under the umbrella of the city of Kenosha. Um, the Kenosha Museum Complex includes the DDM, the Kenosha Public Museum, which is down by the lake and next to it, the Civil War Museum. Hmm. Uh, the DDM was the vision of Mayor John Antramian and Carthage President uh, Greg Campbell back in the early 2000s. And the city provided the building, the staff, the maintenance, and had the funding to put in the, the exhibit. I was hired to design the main exhibit to get a field program running and also to start a paleontology program at Carthage. Mm-hmm. And so, in terms of the public gallery, we display the evolution of birds from meeting dinosaurs to theropods. We have 21 casts on display, um, everything from Herrerasaurus to Suchomimus to Torvosaurus to Anzu to Gansus and even the modern harpy eagle <laughs> and a selection of other modern birds. In the basement is the CIP, which is the lab, and my preparator, Dr. Megan Seitz, heads the lab. Uh, train students and volunteers to, to prepare the dinosaur fossils that we collect from southeastern Montana. So my field work is based in the Hell Creek Formation in Carter County, and I teach a field course where I take students out from Carthage. Uh, just recently, we've teamed up with the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, so we've had some MIAD students and professors out with us just this past summer. Hmm. And so we collect everything. Uh, we're just not focused on the dinosaurs. I want to know everything about the last stretch of the age of dinosaurs in our area. So we collect dinosaurs, obviously. We collect macrovertebrate and microvertebrate material, fish, turtles. And we even, we even collect plants. And just this summer, we've had great success in locating a candidate for the impact layer in our area. So we have the top of the Hell Creek Formation as well as the bottom of what's called the Fort Union Formation, which represents the earliest uh, part of the age of mammals hmm. in the American West. And we have the so-called Z coal, and within that we have found four localities where we have the impact layer. And we just found the impact layer this summer, and in the last hour and a half on our last day, <laughs> we found three additional localities. Oh, wow. <laughs> all within a very short period of time, which was just amazing. Yeah, that's great. And we also accept volunteers. Uh, the field course lasts two weeks out there, and then we're out there for a full month. After the students leave, we have a team of volunteers come in, and the volunteers are from all walks of life. Everyone from truck drivers to pipe fitters to graphic novel artists to graduate students do accompany our scientific team, which is I'm happy to say, building up incrementally year to year. That's, That's really, really great, cool. yeah. And so if people from the general public are interested in joining us on a dinosaur dig, it's very physically demanding. It's not easy stuff. The conditions are harsh. Mm -hmm. um, but if people are, are interested, um, they're free to get in touch. Do you have an age requirement? Yes, um, preferably 18 and over. Mm -hmm. Those conditions are grueling out there. Sure. If I'm remembering correctly, your, the program that you teach is, it's one of the few or maybe the only one where as an undergrad, you can study paleontology, right? Um, it's one of the few, at least for a small liberal arts college. Of course, there's larger places like University of Toronto, Montana State University, big research one at places that have fully developed programs. In terms of what I offer is students enroll as biology majors. Because in my view, paleontology is a biological science. We're here to learn how evolution happens. So you have to be a biologist primarily to do that. Mm -hmm. And the first official course in the track is the field course, and that's open to gen ed. So they can get into the field immediately. Uh, that's so, what it was. I remember reading that because yeah. that was rare. I want them involved. I want them in the lab. I want them on the field. So... I just had a small pack of them with me this summer, <laughs> which is fantastic. And then the first uh, upper-level course they take is the Gatekeeper, and that's Comparative Anatomy of the Vertebrates. And students have to achieve a certain level in that course and across the board in order to be eligible to get into graduate school. The whole point is to train students for graduate school. Once they succeed in Comparative Anatomy, then they can take the Dinosaur Evolution and Extinction course that I offer. 
If that goes well, then they do an independent study with me where they do an original research project. And this is in their junior year uh, because in the following fall, I have them present that work as a poster at the annual meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology so that they can show original work to prospective graduate advisors and get that whole thing set up. So this is a very uh, deliberate and purposeful program that I've developed at Carthage. And, you know, it's designed to maximally benefit students with ability. Yeah, that's great. That explains at least some of the undergraduates that we always see at SVP and like, you're an undergraduate. What are you doing here? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I'm happy to, you know, to be part of that, be part of making that happen. I think it's really great. It is competitive. Mm -hmm. And I really want my students to have an edge. Uh, competitive edge to get into graduate schools because, you know, as you know, the numbers decrease from one step to the next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And paleontology programs can be pretty competitive. Yeah. And there aren't many, there aren't many paleo programs and the competition is quite high. Mm -hmm. And so I want my, my ducklings to (laughs) to have an edge over the other ducklings. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. (laughs) So you mentioned your website where you post some things, but Are there any other places where listeners, if they wanted to learn more about you and your work, should go? I think uh, for technical articles, they can take a look through Google Scholar. I also have a page on there that gives a list of publications and links to PDFs, I think. There's the blog, uh, Transferodia Central, which I haven't been able to update in some months. I'm just too busy with this ontogeny project, but Mm -hmm. people can look at that stuff. There's some technical stuff rants against commercial collection and just really boring diaries of the projects I'm working on. Um, and people can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is transfer car and I can be found on Facebook as well. Great. Cool. Well, thank you very much for explaining all your thoughts on Tyrannosaurus and Tyrannosaurus and Tyrannosaurus, depending on how you name them. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> Thanks again, Thomas, for talking to us about tyrannosaurs and... And your harsh views on the Jurassic Park dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> we love them, but I understand they're not for everybody. But yeah, thanks for coming on our show and celebrating episode 200 with us. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, onto our dinosaur of the day, Tyrannosaurus. Well, Tyrannosaurus rex, really. It feels weird to say it without the species name, even though we almost always sp- skip the species. Yeah, but for this one, and as Garrett mentioned in the beginning of the episode, we are revisiting this one from episode one because we are celebrating Tyrannosaurus rex for our 200th episode, and this is the first time we've revisited a dinosaur. We very rarely do this, but it seemed like a special enough occasion. So as Samuel L. Jackson would say, hold on to your butts. <laughs> T-Rex was one of the last non-avian dinosaurs before non-avian dinosaurs went extinct, and it was named in 1905 by Henry Fairfield Osborn. Its name means Tyrant Lizard King, and it was named for its large size and for presumably being the apex predator of its time. It was a bipedal carnivore, had a giant skull and a long heavy tail, and as everyone knows, the short forelimbs with the two quad digits, though even though they were short relative to the rest of its body, they were still very powerful. T-Rex was one of the largest known carnivorous theropods. They may have grown up to 40 feet, 12.3 meters long, and up to 12 feet or 3.66 meters tall at the hips, and may have weighed up to 8.4 to 14 metric tons, or 9.3 to 15.4 short tons. They might have grown larger, actually, but to know that for sure, we would need more fossils. Yeah, it's hard to know how big a fossil could have gotten that you haven't found yet. (laughs) Yes, which... Jack Horner said in our interview with him a while back, T-Rex was probably an apex predator. It probably ate hadrosaurs and ceratopsians and ankylosaurs, possibly sauropods. Jack Horner used to say that it was a scavenger, but it was mostly to get people to start thinking critically about whether it would be or not. And how we might tell. Yeah. However, most predators do scavenge when the opportunity arises, so T-Rex probably did too. T-Rex lived in the Cretaceous in what is now western North America on Laramidia, T-Rex fossils have been found in different ecosystems, inland, coastal, subtropical, and semi-arid plains, so they had a wider range than other tyrannosauroids. More than 50 T-Rex specimens have been identified, some of them nearly complete. And just a quick background, Tyrannosaurus is the type genus of Tyrannosauroidea, which is the superfamily, Tyrannosauridae, which is the family, and Tyrannosaurinae, which is the subfamily. 
So it goes Tyrannosauroidea on top, then Tyrannosauridae, and then finally Tyrannosaurinae yes. in increasing specificity. And then I guess Tyrannosaurus at the very last bit. Yes. So Arthur Lakes first found T-Rex teeth in 1874 in Golden, Colorado. And John Bell Hatcher had found bones in eastern Wyoming in the early 1890s that were thought to be Ornithomimus grandus at first, but is now considered to be T-Rex. Edward Drinker Cope found vertebrae fragments in South Dakota in 1892 and originally classified them as Manospondylus gigas, a ceratopsid, but now those are considered to be T-Rex. And Manospondylus gigas means giant porous vertebra. <laughs> that refers to the openings in the bone for blood vessels. Or for lightning from like air sac pressure into it, potentially. Mm -hmm. Osborne recognized the similarities between T-Rex and Manospondylus back in 1917. However, Manospondylus was too fragmentary, so he did not synonymize them. Black Hills Institute found the type locality of Manospondylus in June 2000 and found more Tyrannosaur bones, and they were considered to be from the same individual and the same as those of a T-Rex. Which should make Manospondylus the actual name of Tyrannosaurus and then make Tyrannosaurus a junior synonym. Yes. However, an ICZN ruling in 2000 said that a name that's been considered valid for 50 years can't be replaced by a name considered invalid during that time, plus some other stipulations, all of which apply here. So the T-Rex name stays, which is a good thing. It's got a more exciting meaning. <laughs> than Manospondylus, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Barnum Brown found the first partial T-Rex skeleton in Wyoming in 1900, and Osborne originally named it Dynamosaurus Imperiosus in a paper in 1905. In 1902, Brown found another partial T-Rex skeleton in Montana in the Hell Creek Formation. Osborne described this skeleton as the holotype of T-Rex in the same 1905 paper where he described Dynamosaurus. In 1906, Osborne said that the two specimens were synonyms and said that T-Rex was the valid name, which is a good choice. <laughs> The Dynamosaurus bones are in the collections of the Natural History Museum in London. Other synonyms to T-Rex include Dinotyrannus megagracilis and Stygivenator molnari. Only holotypes of Dinotyrannus and Stygivenator have been found, and they're now considered to be of a juvenile T-Rex. Dinotyrannus megagracilis was originally named Albertosaurus megagracilis, and that was found in the same formation as T-Rex. There is also Oblisodon Lensensis, which is now considered to be either a juvenile T-Rex or a nanotyrannus. And of course, there are debates on the validity <laughs> of nanotyrannus lensensis. Some think that that skull is of a juvenile T-Rex. Uh, some of the differences, people have argued, though, is that nanotyrannus has more teeth. And some scientists think that the two should be separate until more studies are done. And in our interview, Thomas Carr mentioned that the description of nanotyrannus talked about the damage to the skull and described either juvenile features or features of T-Rex. So you know where he stands. There's also some controversy over whether Tarbosaurus batar from Mongolia is a second species of Tyrannosaurus or its own genus. In 1955, Evgeny Maliv named Tyrannosaurus batar from Mongolia, and this was renamed Tarbosaurus batar by 1965, and many think that they are sister taxon. Tarbosaurus is thought to have a narrower skull and a different kind of bite. Although there were studies in 2014 and 2016 that found that they're closely related, and then in 2016, Steve Brusati, Thomas Carr, and others found that Tyrannosaurus may have been from Asia and possibly descended from Tarbosaurus. Also, T-Rex may have driven Tyrannosaurids native to North America to extinction via competition. However, in 2006, a study found that large Tyrannosaurids may have been in North America as early as 75 million years ago, though it's not clear if that was T-Rex or a new Tyrannosaur genus. Well, it's probably not T-Rex because 10 million years would be a long time for it to be around. True. On August 12, 1990, Sue Hendrickson found the most complete and largest T-Rex skeleton in the Hell Creek Formation in South Dakota that's been found so far. It's about 85% complete. And this T-Rex is nicknamed Sue. There was a legal battle over who owned it, which is covered in the documentary Dinosaur 13, and it involves Pete Larson, who we interviewed in our first episode, mm -hmm. which also talked about T-Rex. In 1997, it was settled in favor of the original landowner, Maurice Williams, and then the Field Museum of Natural History bought the skeleton at auction for $7.6 million. It was the most expensive dinosaur so far. Between 1998 and 1999, the Field Museum spent 25,000 hours preparing the bones. Partly at Disney World. Really? Yeah. They had some like weird joint deal where I think... 
Disney might have paid partially for that $7.6 million or something. Oh, I remember McDonald's. I didn't remember Disney. Yeah, I think McDonald's was involved too. It was a whole huge (laughs) corporate weird thing (laughs) that went on. Yeah. Well, Sue went on display May 17th, 2000 and is now one of the most famous T-Rex. And Sue the T-Rex actually has a Twitter account and over 42,000 followers, maybe more by the time this recording comes out. The most followed dinosaur, perhaps? (laughs) Could be. I didn't look too closely. A study of Sue found that she was full grown at age 19 and died at age 28, possibly from a bite to the back of the head. But this isn't confirmed and later studies actually didn't find bite marks. She had damage to the back of her skull. She was possibly trampled after her death. It's possible that she died of starvation after getting a parasitic infection from eating contaminated meat. She may have gotten an inflammation in her throat and then been unable to swallow food. And this is based on her having smooth-edged holes in her skulls, which are similar to modern-day birds that have had the same parasite, which sounds like a terrible way to go. Mm -hmm. There's another famous T-Rex, Stan, which is nicknamed in honor of Stan Sacrison. And Stan was found in 1987 in the Hell Creek Formation in South Dakota, though wasn't collected until 1992. Originally, Stan was thought to be a triceratops skeleton. Stan is 63% complete. You can see Stan on display at the Black Hills Institute of Geological Research in Hill City, where Pete Larson is, and that's in South Dakota. There's many casts and museums all over the world of Stan, too. Yeah, we've seen them all over the place. And at one of them, we told someone working there, like, oh, we saw the original on the Black Hills Institute in South Dakota, and they're like, that's not where the original is. That's crazy. (laughs) They didn't believe us. We're like, no, we saw it. (laughs) We know the guy who dug it up. Like, why don't you believe us? They're like... They wouldn't put that there. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't look like we knew what we were talking about, apparently. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so Stan's had many pathologies. It's had broken and healed ribs, broken and healed neck, and a hole in the back of his head. It's about the size of a T-Rex tooth. Jack Horner found five T-Rex skeletons in Montana in 2000. That's crazy. Yeah. In 2001, a crew from the Burpee Museum of Natural History found a 50% complete juvenile T-Rex in Hell Creek in Montana, nicknamed Jane. And Jane was thought to be the first known skeleton of Nanotyrannus, but now is thought to be a juvenile T-Rex. She's on display at the Burpee Museum. Because a wide range of T-Rex specimens have been found, scientists have estimated its lifespan and how fast T-Rex grew. The smallest known T-Rex is the Jordan theropod, which was estimated to weigh 66 pounds or 30 kilograms and died at age two. The largest one is Sue, who's estimated to weigh 12,460 pounds or 5,650 kilograms and died at age 28. Juvenile T-Rex tend to be under 4,000 pounds or 1,800 kilograms until they're around age 14, and then they grow quickly, gaining an average of 1,300 pounds or 600 kilograms each year for four years, and then their growth slows again. Pretty similar to humans. (laughs) They're like a teenage growth spurt. But on a much smaller scale for humans. (laughs) Yeah. Another study found that the growth rate was actually faster at 4,000 pounds or 1,800 kilograms, which is very different from 1,300 pounds, though the author said that it had a smaller gap between its actual growth rate and the one expected of it based on its size. The slowdown of its growth rate may indicate maturity. B-Rex, which was a 16 to 20-year-old T-Rex found in Montana, was found to have medullary tissue in its femur, and medullary tissue is only found in female birds during ovulation, so B-Rex was able to reproduce. More than half of the known T-Rex specimens died within six years of reaching maturity, as seen in other tyrannosaurs, and some modern large birds and mammals. That's assuming that the fossil record isn't biased. I guess that pertains to its range, too. Right. Not many juvenile T-Rex fossils have been found. This is possibly due to low mortality rates. They grew up, so they weren't fossilized as juveniles. Or it's because not enough fossils have been found, or because fossils that were collected tend to be larger. Thomas Holtz Jr. suggested in 2013 that dinosaurs, quote, lived fast and died young, which means they reproduce quickly, unlike mammals that take longer to reproduce. Gregory Paul also said that T-Rex reproduced quickly and died young, possibly because they lived dangerous lives. Scientists analyzed the variation in body types of T-Rex and found two types, the robust type and the gracile type. The robust type has been attributed to females in the past. They had a wider pelvis, maybe to pass eggs through, and they had a smaller chevron on the first tail vertebra, so also possibly to help eggs pass through. However, a 2005 study cast doubts on this sexual dimorphism. Also, Sue had a full-size chevron on the first tail vertebra, so that doesn't help differentiate. Instead of sexual dimorphism, the differences in body types could be because of geography or age, maybe older animals were the robust ones. 
only B. rex is the likely female because only female birds have medullary tissues naturally. However, studies have found that crocodiles do not have medullary tissue. T. rex had a large head and could bite in the backs and necks of dinosaurs that were prey. Montana State University has the largest T. rex skull found so far. It's 59 inches or 150 centimeters long compared to Sue's 55.4 inches or 141 centimeter long skull. And that was found in the 1960s and recently reconstructed. There's a press release that came out in 2006. The skull had large fenestra or openings to reduce the weight, and T-Rex had a narrow snout, but the skull was wide in the back, which helped with having good binocular vision. Also, the eye sockets faced mainly forwards, which helped with the good binocular vision. Kent Stevens found that T-Rex had great vision. A study found that T-Rex had a binocular range of 55 degrees, which is better than a hawk, and T-Rex would have been able to see objects as far as 3.7 miles or 6 kilometers away. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what that was related to a person, and I found something saying that a person can see about two miles, I think, in a similar sort of fashion, so maybe it's about twice as far as a person. Crazy. Lawrence Wittmer and Ryan Ridgely found that T-Rex had heightened sensory abilities, these rapid eye and head movements, also the ability to sense low-frequency sounds and had a good sense of smell. If T-Rex hunted its prey... Then prey would have included triceratops and chylosaurs and hadrosaurs that may have had these complex social behaviors, so precision would have been important to get in and out. T-Rex had large olfactory bulbs and nerves, and so they may have been able to smell carcasses from far away, comparable to modern vultures. And as I mentioned, they could hear low-frequency sounds. T-Rex had a relatively large brain for adult non-avian dinosaurs. In 2012, Carl Bates and Peter Falkingham said that T-Rex had the most powerful bite of any land animal. They found an adult could have been between 7,800 and 12,800 pounds of force in its back teeth, and some scientists have estimated higher. Greg Erickson and Paul Gignac said in 2017 that T-Rex could have bite forces of 1,900 to 7,700 pounds and could crush bones. Steven Lautenschlager and others found that T-Rex could open its jaw around 80 degrees and could have a wide range of jaw angles for biting. The tip of the T-Rex upper jaw was U-shaped, which meant it could rip out more tissue and bone in one bite, though that would have been stressful on its front teeth. T-Rex had heterodont teeth, different shapes. Jaws had up to 60 teeth, and the teeth have been described as, quote, like lethal bananas. Yeah, I really like that description. It's pretty accurate. (laughs) Yeah. The largest T-Rex tooth found so far was 12 inches or 30.5 centimeters long, including the root when it was alive. So T-Rex, it had the heterodont teeth that meant that they had different functions. This is according to a 2012 study. The front teeth were for gripping and pulling. The side teeth may have been for tearing flesh and the back teeth could have diced up pieces of meat. The T-Rex teeth were wide and a bit dull, so it could withstand force by struggling prey. T-Rex may have had a septic bite. William Abler hypothesized that teeth serrations may have had pieces of meat with bacteria in them, which would make T-Rex bites deadly, like Komodo dragons were thought to have. Jack Horner said that T-Rex serrations were more cube-like than round in shape, like a Komodo dragon's teeth. However, all saliva could contain deadly bacteria, so that may not have been a method for killing prey. T-Rex had an S-shaped curved neck that was short and muscular. In 2007, Eric Snively and Anthony Russell found that T-Rex neck muscles were so strong, T-Rex would have been able to throw a piece of meat that weighed 110 pounds 15 feet into the air and then catch it again, (laughs) which is terrifying. According to Michael Habib, T-Rex had thick neck muscles to hold its skull and give it a more powerful bite force. The neck muscles compete for space in the shoulder with arm muscles, and the neck is bigger than the arms. And according to Habib, long arms are more easily broken and take more energy and can get disease, so the short arms may have been more beneficial to T-Rex. Also just bone in general taking a lot of extra resources. True. A 2016 study suggested that large theropods like Tyrannosaurus had lips that covered their teeth based on the fact that they had enamel and enamel would need to stay hydrated. Thomas Carr and others found in 2017 that tyrannosaurs had large flat scales on their snouts with small keratinized patches, and they suggested that tyrannosaurs had sensory neurons under the scales on their faces and may have used them to identify objects and measure the temperatures of nests and pick up eggs and hatchlings. The headlines were all about mating. Compared to the rest of its body, T-Rex arms are relatively small at about 3.3 feet or 1 meters long, and they have large areas for muscle attachments, so they were probably very strong. Osborne said in 1906 that the forelimbs may have been used to grasp a mate while mating, and others have suggested that T-Rex used its arms to help get it up after falling. The arms may have also been used to hold down prey while tearing it to pieces with its jaws. 
Yeah, and it had pretty sharp claws too, so the arms would still definitely be useful. Mm -hmm. T-Rex forelimb bones had thick cortical bone, which might mean it could withstand heavy loads. An adult T-Rex biceps brachii muscle could lift 439 pounds or 199 kilograms, <laughs> and it had other muscles to make it even more powerful. It was like a, over a 400-pound curl then yeah. with one arm. <laughs> yeah. T-Rex arms did have a limited range of motion. Uh, the shoulder joints could only move 40 degrees and the elbow joints could only move 45 degrees. So all of these factors may mean that T-Rex used its arms to hold struggling prey. One scientist, Stephen Stanley, said that T-Rex may have used its arms for slashing prey, especially juvenile T-Rex, because the arms grew slower in proportion to their bodies. Hmm, so they weren't as disproportional as kids. Right. Earlier, tyrannosaurs like Eotyrannus had proportionately longer arms than T-Rex, and as tyrannosaurs got bigger over time, their arms got shorter. So some scientists think that this group would have eventually lost its arms if it kept evolving, but we'll never know for sure. I think that's feasible since you've got stuff like Carnotaurus with the really, really tiny arms. That's really the dinosaur, the big carnivore with the smallest arms. Yeah, and true. There's, there's basically nothing left at that point. When T-Rex was first found, they had only found the humerus part of the forelimb. So Osborne mounted his T-Rex in 1915 to have three fingers like Allosaurus. Lawrence Lamb had described the two fingers of Gorgosaurus, a close relative, in 1914, but this wasn't confirmed for T-Rex until 1989 when the Wankel Rex was found with complete forelimbs. Sue also has complete forelimbs. T-Rex had many hollow bones to help it reduce weight. And it had a long tail that helped balance its head and body. The tail sometimes had over 40 vertebrae. A juvenile T-Rex may have had feathers, but adult T-Rex probably had no feathers. Skin impressions that have been found show it had a pebble-like structure. Others say that there's no direct evidence that T-Rex had feathers, but it's likely to have had feathers on at least parts of the body, based on related species having feathers. For example, D-Long had feathers. Scientists think that feathers may have been related to body size, where juveniles were feathered and then shed them and only had scales when they got bigger because they no longer needed the insulation. Though some large tyrannosauroids had feathers covering most of the body, so it's not clear if this hypothesis is true. An example of this is Eutyrannus. It was 30 feet or 9 meters long, weighed up to 3,100 pounds or 1,400 kilograms, and it had feathers on various parts of its body, which may mean that its whole body was covered in feathers. Skin impressions of a T-Rex specimen found in Montana in 2002, nicknamed Y-Rex, showed small patches of scales. It's possible that feathers in tyrannosauroids varied based on body size, climate, or other factors. In March 2005, Mary Higby Schweizer and others said that they had found soft tissue from the marrow cavity of a T-Rex leg bone found in the Hell Creek Formation. It had blood vessel tissue and microstructures resembling blood cells that somewhat resembled ostrich blood cells and vessels. It's not clear if something strange happened to preserve these or if the material is original, though if it is original, it would help scientists figure out some of the DNA content of dinosaurs. And it's possible that no one had found this before because they didn't think it was possible and so they weren't looking. Since then, these tissue-like structures have been found in two more tyrannosaurs and a hadrosaur. It wouldn't be much of the DNA content, though. It's basically just a protein, which is a very, very small piece. Yes, but still exciting. Yeah. In 2007, Asar and others found that seven traces of collagen proteins found in T-Rex bone most closely matched those in chickens. Finding proteins in fossils so old changed scientists' views of fossils, because before it was thought that fossilization replaced all living tissue with minerals. More studies in 2008 showed the close connection between T-Rex and modern birds. In 2008, Thomas K. and others questioned the soft tissue in T-Rex, saying that it was actually slimy biofilm made by bacteria. And they found that what had been thought to be remnants of blood cells were actually framboids. They had iron presence, which were microscopic mineral spheres with iron. The researchers had found similar spheres in other fossils from different periods, including ammonite. In the ammonite, the spheres were found in a place where the iron could not have been related to the presence of blood. Schweitzer criticized this study, saying that there's no reported evidence that biofilms can produce branching hollow tubes like the ones that she found in her study. In 2011, San Antonio, Schweitzer, and others published details on the parts of the collagen that had been recovered, which were the inner parts of the collagen coil, as expected from a long period of protein degradation. For a long time, it was thought that T. rex and other dinosaurs were ectothermic, or basically cold-blooded. In the 1960s, Bob Bakker and John Ostrom challenged this idea in the dinosaur renaissance, T-Rex was thought to be endothermic, warm-blooded, and active. The growth rates indicate that it had a high metabolism. Reese Barrick and William Showers looked at the oxygen isotope ratios in a T-Rex torso vertebrae and tibia. This ratio is sometimes used to determine the temperature of the bone when it was deposited. 
they found very little difference in temperature, only 4 to 5 degrees Celsius or 7 to 9 degrees Fahrenheit, which they said indicated that T. rex had a constant internal body temperature known as homeothermy and had a metabolism in between ectothermic reptiles and endothermic mammals. Some scientists said that the ratio of oxygen isotopes in fossils from today do not necessarily represent the same ratio in the past, and they may have changed during fossilization. In later papers, Barrick and Shower said that they found similar results in Gigantosaurus. Even if T. rex had evidence of homeothermy, it doesn't mean that it was endothermic. T. rex may have had a warm-blooded metabolism through gigantothermy, where its surface area was small compared to its volume of mass, and that meant less area for heat to escape the body, which raised its base temperature. Several footprints have been found that may have been from a T. rex. One track was found in 1983 in New Mexico that was 33 inches or 83 centimeters long and 28 inches or 71 centimeters wide. One track found in 2007 in Montana had a 28 inch or 72 centimeter long one. It wasn't clear if that was T. rex. And one track found in 2016 in Wyoming was thought to be either from a juvenile T. rex or a nanotyrannus. Yeah, it's really hard to identify which exact animal a track comes from. But I guess since it was so huge, <laughs> you might think like, well, it's a theropod track and it's too big to be anything else. Yeah. So there's a lot of different estimates for T-Rex max speed, mostly 25 miles per hour, 40 kilometers per hour. Some are as low as 11 to 25 miles per hour or 18 to 40 kilometers per hour. And some are as high as 45 miles per hour or 72 kilometers per hour. And this is based on the tracks found, but not many have been found of large theropods running. Yeah, I don't think we really have any running tracks, maybe like one or two, because they spend literally 99.9 something percent of their time walking. So <laughs> it's hard to find a running track. Yeah. There's another study in 2017 that found T Rex could reach a max speed of 17 miles per hour or 27 kilometers per hour. Most recent research on T Rex locomotion suggests that T Rex reached max speeds of 25 miles or 40 kilometers per hour, and that faster speeds were not possible because they required very big leg muscles. However, it's unknown how large T Rex leg muscles were. In 2007, there was a study with computer models that estimated running speeds of up to 18 miles per hour or 29 kilometers per hour. Even a max speed, though, of 11 miles per hour or 18 kilometers per hour is faster than a lot of prey, like some hadrosaurs and ceratopsians. So there's a lot of debates whether or not T-Rex could run. It's possible that T-Rex didn't run. T-Rex may have also been slow to turn. It might have taken one to two seconds to turn 45 degrees. And this is based on its center of mass being far from its center of rotation. Yeah, and I think it also would have had a high moment of inertia, basically with its head so far out front and its tail so far behind it. The force required to spin that kind of thing. It's like that old analogy for ice skating with your arms out versus in. When you have that really long length around the thing that you're spinning, it takes a lot of energy and time to spin. So that was also probably an issue. Yeah, good point. In 1993, Jack Horner and Don Lessum said that T-Rex was slow and probably couldn't run because the ratio of its femur and tibia was larger than one, like in many other large theropods and in modern elephants. In 1998, Christensen said that T-Rex leg bones were in not much stronger than elephants and suggested a max speed of 25 miles per hour, but this is based on many dubious assumptions. In 1995, Farlow and others said that T. rex, weighing between 5.4 and 7.3 metric tons, 6 to 8 short tons, would have been seriously or fatally hurt if it fell while moving quickly and its small arms could not help on impact. However, giraffes can run up to 31 miles per hour, 50 kilometers per hour, though they can break a leg or be fatally hurt. So it could be that T-Rex ran when necessary. Yeah, we do see a lot of T-Rex with broken gastralia or those belly ribs. That mm -hmm. kind of makes sense. The belly flops. In 2017, William Sellers and others found via a computer model that T-Rex could not run because of high skeletal loads. They estimated T-Rex to weigh 7 tons, and the model showed that moving more than 11 miles per hour would have shattered the T-Rex leg bones. There's also that thing we talk about with close running, where birds don't necessarily have to be at a full run or a walk the way people do, and then there's like a pretty big speed gap in the middle. They can kind of pick a lot of speeds in between. So saying it couldn't run, it might have been able to do some pretty extreme power walking anyway and still be pretty quick. Yeah. In 2011, Heinrich Mallison proposed that T-Rex and other dinosaurs could have moved quickly by power walking, like he said. They found a few similarities in dinosaurs and race walkers with less muscle mass in the ankles and more muscle mass in the hindquarters. Hmm. 
However, John Hutchinson cautioned that scientists must first look into dinosaur muscles to see how frequently they contracted. That's difficult. Yes. However, T-Rex did have hollow bones and other features to make it more lightweight, and other animals such as ostriches have long, flexible legs and can run fast, but they take slow strides as well. T-Rex did have larger leg muscles than any current living animal. Gregory S. Paul said that T-Rex had a large ilium bone to help support large muscles for running and other features, and that one formula to calculate speed was not that reliable because it was too sensitive to bone length, making long bones artificially weak. He also said that the risk of being hurt while fighting may have been worth the risk for T-Rex falling while running. Yeah, if you're running away from danger. Mm -hmm. In 2010, Scott Persons suggested that T-Rex may have had strong catafemoralis or tail muscles to help with its speed. It had certain muscle arrangements with some similarities to modern reptiles. The catafemoralis may have helped with running, agility, and balance. Additionally, a T-Rex tail muscle mass may have been underestimated by 25 to 45 percent. Having a larger catafemoralis means that the center of mass would be closer to the hindquarters and hips and would have helped it with rotating more quickly. Yeah, and it, it also kind of draws a leg up, so it would help it lift its leg quicker too. In 1998, Holtz said that tyrannosaurids and some close relatives had long shins and toes compared to other theropod femurs, and that tyrannosaurids and relatives had tightly interlocked foot bones to help with locomotion, and therefore tyrannosaurids and its close relatives were the fastest large theropods. In 2013, Holtz said that large allosaurs had shorter feet than T-Rex, though they were similarly sized, and T-Rex had longer, skinnier, and more interlocked feet, which were attributes of animals that move faster. In 2003, Eric Snively and Anthony P. Russell said that T-Rex feet had a, quote, tensile keystone model to increase its stability and help it be more efficient and less strained. T-Rex metatarsals, which are foot bones, are arranged as digitigrade, where they form an extension to the lower leg bones, which increases the total length of the leg area and increases its stride. And this is seen in animals that run after other animals. So lots of debates over T-Rex in general. There's also been a lot of debate over whether T-Rex was a hunter or scavenger. In 1917, Lamb said that T-Rex was close to Gorgosaurus and therefore a scavenger because Gorgosaurus teeth showed hardly any wear on them. However, theropods replace their teeth frequently, so not many people agreed. Jack Horner has argued that T-Rex was a scavenger, though not in scientific literature, and only as a tool to teach people, mostly kids, that you shouldn't make assumptions without evidence. Horner said that T-Rex could not be a predator because of its small eyes, small arms, hmm. couldn't hold the prey, and large legs made it slow. He also said it was a scavenger because of its great sense of smell and legs that were built for walking long distances. But obviously, a lot of those things aren't entirely true. Sure. T-Rex did have a great sense of smell, though, and could smell carcasses from far away, like vultures. In the hunter-scavenger debate, researchers said that T-Rex could not purely be a scavenger because modern pure scavengers, like vultures, glide to cover large areas efficiently. Others have said that T-Rex's ecosystem would have had many animals to scavenge, although T-Rex may have had to be cold-blooded to get enough calories from scavenging than the calories it spent foraging. They also argued that animals during T-Rex's time didn't have gliding scavengers, so there was no competition for this type of food. Hmm. If T-Rex was a scavenger, it may have been big enough to steal food, but it may have been outnumbered by smaller theropods. Some of T-Rex prey could move pretty fast, so if T-Rex could only walk, it was probably more likely to scavenge. However, T-Rex may have been fast enough for large hadrosaurs and ceratopsians. Because T-Rex teeth could crush bone, it could get to the bone marrow, which is very nutritious and recently described to us as meat butter. <laughs> Garrett and Chin and others found bone fragments and coprolites from tyrannosaurs, though they said tyrannosaur teeth were not adapted to chew bone the way modern hyenas are to get to bone marrow. Yeah, it's more like breaking it over your knee kind of thing. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned, T-Rex's eyes pointed forward, so it had good binocular vision, which is found mostly in predators, so that points to a hunting behavior. Jack Horner has said that there's a trend of steadily improving binocular vision in tyrannosaurs, though it's not clear why if tyrannosaurs were scavengers. One Edmontosaurus skeleton has been found to have damage to its tail vertebrae from a T-Rex that healed, which shows that it probably survived an attack and that meant a T-Rex tried to hunt it. There's also evidence of an attack on a triceratops that had a partially healed tyrannosaur tooth mark on its neck frill and had a broken horn with new bone growth after the break. It's unclear who initiated this fight. It could have been either. Since the wounds healed, the triceratops probably survived. In 2001, Bruce Rothschild and others did a study examining evidence of stress factors in tendon avulsions, which is injury to the bone where a tendon or ligament attaches to the bone in theropods. In Tyrannosaurus and Allosaurus, they found avulsion injuries only in the forelimb and shoulder that suggests that their musculature was different from birds. 
They suggested that the tendon avulsion in Sue the T-Rex was probably from struggling prey, which is evidence for being an active predator instead of scavenging for food. Most scientists, though, think that T-Rex was both a hunter and scavenger, like many large carnivores. Pete Larson found a broken and healed fibula and tail vertebrae on Sue, some scarred bones from the face, and a tooth from a different T-Rex in a neck vertebra. And this may mean that tyrannosaurs were aggressive with each other, though it's not clear if it would be about food or finding a mate, or if it was because they were being cannibalistic. Later studies found these wounds were infections or damage to the bones after Sue died, and not necessarily injuries, or that the injuries were pretty generic and not necessarily from a fight with another T-Rex. Phil Curry has suggested that T-Rex could have hunted in packs. He compared T-Rex to Tarbosaurus and Albertosaurus and mentioned three T-Rex skeletons found in South Dakota near to each other. He did CT scans and said that its brain was three times larger than expected for its body size, so it may have been capable of this kind of complex behavior. Prey such as Triceratops and Ankylosaurus would have been armored and fast, so T-Rex may have needed to hunt in groups. It's possible that juveniles and adults work together with juveniles running down the prey and adults killing it. A lot of scientists, though, don't agree with this theory. This theory has not been peer-reviewed. It was part of his book, Dino Gangs, and a TV special. It's based on comparing T-Rex to different species, and the idea of Tarbosaurus hunting in packs hasn't been published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal yet. Other explanations for theropod skeletons ending up together could be droughts or floods. Lawrence Whitmer said that social behavior can't be determined by estimated brain sizes, though T-Rex may have had large enough brains for communal hunting, this semi-organized behavior. In July 2014, fossilized trackways found in Canada showed that tyrannosaurids may have hunted in packs. In 2010, Curry, Horner, Erickson, and Longridge suggested that T-Rex could be cannibalistic. They found T-Rex specimens with T-Rex tooth marks on their bones, the humerus, foot bones, and metatarsals, which might be evidence of opportunistic scavenging. These parts of the body didn't have much meat, so T-Rex may have been eating a carcass that had already been chewed on. It's possible that other tyrannosaurids were also cannibalistic. In 2009, a study found that holes in some Tyrannosaurus skulls that were thought to be from attacks from other Tyrannosaurus were actually from Trichomonas-like parasites that often affect avians. However, Joseph Peterson and others found evidence that Jane the juvenile T-Rex was attacked by another T-Rex. Her skull had healed puncture wounds on the upper jaw and snout, probably from another juvenile T-Rex, and CT scans showed the wounds came from a traumatic injury and that there was some healing after. They also said Jane's injuries were structurally different from the parasite pathologies found in Sioux. T-Rex used to be depicted as a living tripod with its tail dragging, similar to a kangaroo. Henry Fairfield Osborne posed his T-Rex skeleton at the American Museum of Natural History this way, and it stayed like that from 1915 until 1992, and that inspired many depictions in films and paintings, including Rudolph Zallinger's The Age of Reptiles mural and Yale University's Peabody Museum of Natural History. In the 1970s, scientists realized that this was not the right posture for T-Rex and that it would have weakened or dislocated joints. And then Jurassic Park showed T-Rex in the more modern pose. T-Rex appears in many films, ads, posts, stamps, and other media. It's a very popular dinosaur and appears in many forms of media, and of course it's a popular name. Henry Fairfield Osborne said in 1905, quote, I propose to make this animal the type of the new genus, Tyrannosaurus, in reference to its size, which far exceeds that of any carnivorous land animal hitherto described. This animal is, in fact, the new plus ultra of the evolution of the large carnivorous dinosaurs. In brief, it is entitled to the royal and high-sounding group name <laughs> which I have applied to it, end quote. The royal and high-sounding group name. It's yeah. pretty accurate. Osborne considered mounting the two T-Rex skeletons that were known at the time to face off over a carcass at the American Museum of Natural History, but then decided to mount just the one. On December 30th of 1905, the New York Times said T-Rex was, quote, the most formidable fighting animal of which there is any record whatever, the king of all kings in the domain of animal life, the absolute warlord of the earth, and a royal man-eater of the jungle. In 1906, T-Rex was called the prize fighter of antiquity and the last of the great reptiles and the king of them all. There's some good little quotes about T-Rex. Good title, yeah. In 1927, Charles Knight painted a mural of Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops for the Field Museum of Natural History. You can see T-Rex in many films, including 1925's The Lost World, 1933's King Kong, 1918's The Ghost of Slumber Mountain, which shows a T-Rex facing off against Triceratops. Hmm. T-Rex is often depicted as having three fingers in the early films, like in Fantasia. Walt Disney told Barnum Brown that it looked better that way. Yeah, I could see that. 
Two fingers look kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> One of the first times T-Rex was portrayed in the proper posture without the tail dragging was the 1984 short Prehistoric Beast made by Phil Tippett with his go motion technique, which is stop motion animation and motion blur. Phil Tippett also worked on Jurassic Park and they used CGI instead of stop motion. And when he first learned they'd use CGI, he said, I've just become extinct and Spielberg used that line in the movie. <laughs> when they said like, I think we're out of a job and then somebody says, you mean extinct? Yes. <laughs> T-Rex is also in all the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World movies, the 1960 movie Dinosaurus, the 1966 movie One Million Years B.C., The Last Dinosaur from 1977, The Land Before Time from 1988, We're Back, A Dinosaur Story from 1993, Tammy and the T-Rex from 1994, Theodore Rex from 1995, Toy Story from 1995, Pooh's Grand Adventure, The Search for Christopher Robin in 1997, Night at the Museum from 2006, Meet the Robinsons from 2007, Ice Age 3, Dawn of the Dinosaurs from 2009, The Good Dinosaur from 2015, and countless others. Also, Godzilla is a mixture of Tyrannosaurus, Stegosaurus, and Iguanodon. That's why it looks so weird. T-Rex has also appeared in Japanese animated films such as You Are Umasu from 2010. We did a review of that one. The Age of the Great Dinosaurs from 1979, Magic Treehouse from 2011, and Do Raymond, Nobita's Dinosaur from 1980 and 2006. T-Rex has also been in many TV shows, including Barney and Friends, <laughs> Dinosaur Train, The Wiggles, the 1974 Doctor Who Invasion of the Dinosaurs, Dinosaurs, the TV show with the Sinclairs, and many, many more. And T-Rex has also appeared in the TV documentary Dinosaurs from 1985, which used some scenes from the 1984 short prehistoric beast, the one by Phil Tippett. T-Rex has also appeared in documentaries including Walking with Dinosaurs, When Dinosaurs Roamed America, Dinosaur Planet, and more. And in books, including Jurassic Park and the sequel The Last World, Primeval Extinction Event, We're Back, A Dinosaur Story, and also many more. Including Bolivar. Yep. T-Rex is also in video games, on stamps, in comics, and as animatronics for various exhibitions. In Lake Buena Vista, Florida, you can go to T-Rex Cafe, where you eat food and hang out with life-sized dinosaurs. And... Mark Bolin, who was the lead singer of a popular band from the 1970s, first saw T-Rex at the Natural History Museum in London and later named his band Tyrannosaurus Rex, which became T-Rex, and it was actually abbreviated properly with the T-Dot-Rex. Yeah, rather than a hyphen, like yep. you usually see. And they were a very influential British rock band in the 60s and 70s, and also the inspiration, as we mentioned in a recent episode for the dinosaur that is in the Chrome game, or at least that was the code name for yeah. the dinosaur in the early designs. And our fun fact of the day is that most birds have relatively large eyes for the size of their head, but their eyes aren't fully spherical. They're actually kind of flattened on the back, so they can't rotate their eyes in their sockets in most cases. This means that they have to move their entire head to look at something new or to keep looking at the same thing, which is why when they're walking, they kind of bob their head. It's because their eyes can't adjust from the motion, so they move their whole head to kind of keep things in focus. When I read that, that made me wonder if T-Rex in Jurassic Park could have seen the kids in the car when it has its head kind of parallel to the car and it's looking in sideways, because obviously they had stereoscopic vision going forward, so I wasn't sure if they could focus an eye out the side. And they probably couldn't if they had bird-type vision because they don't have, like, pigeon eyes that are, like, focused out the sides. And thanks to Thomas Carr, I also checked out crocodilian vision. So crocodilians actually have an extra sensitive horizontal strip of, quote-unquote, high spatial acuity. Basically, they can scan the surroundings horizontally without moving their heads, which is obviously a very good adaptation for the type of ambush predator that crocodilians are, because if they had to move their head <laughs> to look around at the shore the whole time or look around in the water for fish, they'd be stirring up the water and startling off all sorts of prey. So if T-Rex had that sort of additional adaptation, it might have been able to see into the car, but I'm guessing that it probably didn't because T-Rex and other similar theropods had sclerotic rings on their eyes. In fact, most dinosaurs and birds do, but crocodilians don't. So it seems like T-Rex probably had more of a bird-like eyeball, so it probably had to move its head around to look at new things rather than being able to move its eye around. So probably couldn't have seen them in the car, is my guess. It's good for the kids. Yeah. 
<laughs> but it could have seen all the people that weren't moving. So I think a lot more people would have been eaten <laughs> overall. Sure. Unless the T-Rex thought they were too much of a hassle. Yeah, that's true. And that wraps up this epic 200th episode Tyrannosaurus-tastic <laughs> episode <laughs> of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to us so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And you can join our growing community at Patreon. If you join in the next few weeks, we will be offering special rewards to celebrate SVP. Check out our page at patreon.com slash I Dino. Thanks again. And until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.